begin digging into our important topic today, a progressive snapshot of the primaries, the midterm primaries. Again, I'm Daniel Stein. I'm one of the leaders of the Monthly Monday series for progressive, uh, Monthly Mondays for Progressive Minds, hosted by the Global Progressive Caucus. I'm here from Mexico and I vote in Illinois. Uh, one of my main concerns for the country at the moment for the US is the big money corrupting our elections and our elected officials who should, uh, but don't always represent us. I invite you to use the chat box directing your message to everyone and share where you are joining from today. Again, I've said that before. So if you uh, have any concerns regarding the topic today, regarding the primaries and the state of our nation, please feel free to include those as well. Um, the, we want candidates who will tell the truth about where the nation's at and will work hard on behalf of the people and our residency on this planet. Um, so tell us a little bit about what some of your issues are today and some of what your concerns are today. I see getting big money out of politics from Sue. See, we have gun control. Yes, that is clearly on the right on the minds of many, I believe. And voting rights. Thank you, Eric. Um, right. So, I think that the, of course, systemic racism and healthcare. Thank you, Betsy. So, climate change is certainly a, a concern, Bruce. Thank you, both in the U.S. and uh, I think everywhere where ever we are calling from at the moment. And so with that, um, I'd like to now take us to Western Pennsylvania to hear some progressive Democrat power from Summer Lee uh, and Summer Lee's victory speech. I believe, uh, Eileen, you're gonna be able to pull that up for us and share with us the victory speech from her uh, election just last week. Give me one second to share my screen. Uh, and then we'll hear some words of wisdom here. So, all right. Can you see that? Wait, oh no, I did hit share. One second. <laughs> all right. Now you should be able to see that. All right, everyone, time to tune in for Summer League. Everybody, summer pumps some powerful progressive life into that old yes we can. Welcome to all who are joining us from the Americas, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific for our progressive snapshot of the primaries. As May comes to a close, 14 primaries and runoffs appear in our rearview mirror and 44 on the road ahead. Impressive victories in Texas, Pennsylvania, Oregon, and elsewhere inspire us. A flood of corporate PAC money disrupting the primary playing field intensifies our resolve. 
We accelerate now more than ever. Others may have the money, but we have the people and will unite for progressive power. Just want to take a moment to say, Summer Lee, what a great victory. We honor the Democrats abroad and the, the DNC pledge not to endorse primary candidates. When they win, we talk. Today, inspiring speakers focus our attention on some extremely painful and other very exhilarating events that move us to persist with our mountain of unfinished business. Borrowing from Barbara Jordan, the great Congresswoman from Texas, we assert that what we want is actually quite simple. We want an America as good as its promise. To accomplish that, we employ every tool in our chest, if necessary, we craft new ones. Despite major accomplishments in the fight against the pandemic and no shortage of effort to pass the big and bold legislation necessary for meaningful progress in the quest for economic, racial, social, and environmental justice, 2021 disappointed many of us. We worked hard in support of legislation on issues like reparative justice, reasonable gun legislation and the PRO Act. In the end, little or nothing happened. As the new year began, we returned to our tool chest and considered our legislative, executive and judicial options. While we continue with them, we also look to the midterms, striving to build the Congressional Progressive Caucus and elect Democrats up and down the ballot to improve our chances for success from our nation's capital to the main streets of our country. And while some races in Texas remain too close to call, candidates like John Fetterman and Summer Lee in Pennsylvania, Greg Kazar and Yasmin Crockett in Texas, Jamie McLeod Skinner and Andreas, Andrea, Andrea Salinas in Oregon, as well as others all over the country are paving the way for us. We know what's at stake. Now it's time to get the lay of the land learn from early primary trends for the road ahead and figure out what we can do to ensure victory in November. We know that means voting, volunteering and more. So Amtar, what do you think? What are our next steps? Hi Bruce. I think the next steps should be one, realizing who our allies are and two, knowing it is important to vote for them. We've seen strong progressives like India Walton viciously attacked by both dark money and establishment forces, but it's important to get them into office when they do run so we can hold the Democratic Party accountable to its promises. And as we know all too well, the road from Tulsa to Buffalo has been paved with unkept promises. It was no coincidence that the victims in Buffalo's east side were mostly black. It was no coincidence that there was only one grocery store in the area. Thus, it was no surprise a terrorist could triangulate it as the optimal theater to wage his one white man war against black America. Along the coward's killing tool, the N word was written. Here's your reparations was scrawled across the butt. Acts of racist terror never occur in a vacuum, but are rather part of a wider system of bad leadership and racist policy. Far from a lone wolf, his attack was a sum total of racism, compounded discrimination, and unjust law. The black vote needs honest actors at all levels of government willing to break the cycle of injustice, inequity, and deferred freedom, which leaves us vulnerable. Now's the time to strike back for a new American freedom and for a nation's survival in the throes of late stage white supremacy. This is why our reparations task force asks all Americans to join our radical call for reparative action. This is also why I'm excited to bring on our next guest. Here to talk to us today is Buffalo's own India Walton. Born and raised on Buffalo's east side as one of six children, India became a full-time working mother at the age of just 14. She earned her GED while pregnant with twins who were born prematurely, an experience that inspired her to become a nurse in the same NICU where her boys' lives were saved. As a healthcare worker, India became a representative in the 1199 SEIU Union, 
standing up for both workers and patients from picket lines in Buffalo to the steps of the US Supreme Court, where she was invited to speak at a national women's rights rally in 2014. Continuing to serve as a nurse in Buffalo Public Schools, India witnessed the health disparities among our most vulnerable citizens and became determined to change the systems that cause these injustices. India's commitment to systemic change called her to become a community organizer for Open Buffalo, establishing herself as a thought leader on a wide range of issues, including criminal justice reform and fair housing. Her work on the latter led her to be named the founding executive director of the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust, for which she worked with longtime residents to develop permanently affordable housing. Currently, India is the Western New York Senior Advisor for the New York Working Families Party and a Senior Strategic Organizer for Roots Action. India, thank you for joining us today. We're excited to hear from you about the need for reparative justice and ways to ensure that progressives not only get elected, but also make it into office. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and thank you for all who are in attendance today. Um, as Antar said, my name is India Walton. I am the former duly elected Democratic nominee for Mayor of Buffalo, having won the primary, um, unseated a 16 year four term incumbent with an entirely grassroots campaign. Uh, we won that primary election with an 100% volunteer staff. And similar to Summer Lee, it is proof of what happens when we come together as coalitions that are multiracial, intergenerational, multicultural, who just believe in the power and the deserving um, of working class people in this country. We build it, uh, we keep it strong, and the way that we win is by remaining organized and really coming together under big tents. Um, in my campaign, I did not expect everyone to have the same political analysis as me, but at the end of the day, we can all agree that we want the same things. We want a quality education for our children. We want safe, stable, affordable housing. We want quality union living wage jobs. And we want clean air and water, and we want access to food in every single neighborhood. And what we saw in Buffalo was the culmination of decades worth of disinvestment and the notion that certain neighborhoods and certain groups of people don't deserve the same things that other ones do. And my initial reaction um, was to attack this act of white supremacy, of tragedy and violence, from a reparative framework. As active as our elected officials, as our government, as our policymakers have been about creating the conditions that cause 87% of Black folks to live on the east side of Buffalo in areas of food apartheid. I don't call it a food desert because deserts occur, occur naturally. Food apartheid happens when people in charge make intentional policy decisions that dictate that there's only one grocery store for folks within a five square mile radius to shop at. Um, these are intentional policy decisions. And in the same way that folks actively colluded in ensuring that there was no access to home ownership that there's been little access to upward social mobility, economic mobility, that the wage of wages have, the, have not kept up with the rates of inflation in our community as actively as folks participated in that, we need to be as active in undoing the harm that has been caused in communities of color, working class and poor communities in Buffalo and in rural and urban areas all across the United States. In the same way you deny Black people mortgages, make sure you put extra effort into making sure that people get mortgages. The reason why we founded the Community Land Trust is because we know, I know people in the Fruit Belt neighborhood that's very close to where this tragedy happened. There are people who've been renting homes for 15 and 20 years, renting the same home, 
who paid for it five times over, but can't get extended a mortgage because they're not credit worthy. Well, what is credit worthy? Credit worthy is a, a single mother, a, a, a young couple who are faithful in paying their bills, who make sure their rent is paid, but who have not necessarily had access to traditional financing systems. And I, for one, am tired of begging for the people who have committed these evils against our communities. I'm tired of begging for them to do the right thing. We need to be creating our own. We need to be a self-determined and autonomous community of people who have our own grocery stores, who have our own revolving loan funds, who are focusing on cooperative economics, on worker-owned co-ops, and alternative methods of extending finances and capital to people who are in need, but also the people who have bore the brunt of the building of this country and the sustenance of this country and the enriching and enclosure of power and wealth for the already powerful and wealthy. And we need to prioritize and focus on methods that are going to allow them the security to live decent lives of dignity, of health, and of thriving um, in this country. I've said a lot of words um, and I, I will, I'll leave it there and hang out in case people have questions, thoughts, comments, or ideas. And I also look forward to hearing from all of the other speakers. Thank you again for inviting me. And um, I look forward to continuing to work together in the future. Oh, wow, Indy, I, I, thank you so much. I want to call you Madam Mayor. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the incumbent, incumbent mayor, you, uh, you unseated in the primary, he wouldn't even debate you, is that right? Initially, he refused to debate. Um, once I won the primary, I engaged in a debate with um, him and two other write-in candidates. Um, it's, it's really good footage. If, if folks have the opportunity to see it, um, you should go back and look at it. One point of, um, of reference was my proposal of a 3% incremental tax increase to make sure that um, we, we have the revenue, we're raising the revenue as a municipality to take care of our people, our streets and infrastructure and being told that it wasn't a modest tax increase and um, you know that I was coming for the, the well-to-do's people money. And shortly after he won the, that election, he then proposed a four and a half percent tax increase. Um, oh, so man. it's very, it's very interesting the way um, the other shoes begin to fall. And despite the fact that I had a lot of very intelligent economists and policy experts on my team, the trope was that I was inexperienced, too inexperienced to lead a city. And we had an actual plan for forward progress. Um, but you know, what's, what's different and new is scary. People don't necessarily want change. And, um, you know, I can I continue to do the work on the ground to support organizations and people who are doing the hard work of making sure that our community is taken care of, whether I'm mayor or not. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, um, I want to invite folks um, to let us know if they have a question uh, for um, for India while she's here here with us. Um, in Democrats Abroad, we use the chat box and put star star type in star star hand up. Maybe someone on the team can put in a can put in an example um, of that. And um, it's now's your chance to invite uh, the future, the future of the of the progressive Democratic Party uh, to, uh, to answer a question or um, share your thoughts. I guess I can. Um, um, yeah, I have a I guess I have a question um, for you. Um, I'm actually uh, Oh, Okay. Oh my goodness. Look at all these hands up. Okay. So I'm going to switch to Daniel Stein, uh, who has a hand up. Sure. Thanks, Sue. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I've, I've actually just recently um, read a little bit uh, in, in, in regards to the recent um, massacre uh, in Buffalo. I am curious if there's any knowledge of um, the his, the, the individual's kind of historic, um, like li lineage, I guess is the word, lineage in 
um, in terms of white supremacy um, because my understanding my or my newly kind of under my new understanding about the second amendment is that it was instituted as a uh, individual right in order to further and kind of certify uh the colonial project that is was the us um and so i kind of want to know if there's any knowledge of um the individual who committed this massacre his, it, did, did he have any lineage uh, going back as far as anyone knows, or uh, particularly as far as uh, you might know, India, um, the, in, in, in terms of being connected to, or his family being connected to um, white supremacist colonial um, organizations or ideologies? I know that in his own life, he did have that um, but I wonder if there's a, a lineage going further back. Um, I honestly, and thank you for that question, I honestly haven't looked into it because I don't care. Um, the fact of the matter is that Western New York is a very racist place. It still is. There is a place not far from me called Tanawanda that is known as a sundown town, meaning that if you have skin that looks like mine, you better not get caught there after dark. Um, I often point to um, white supremacist rallies where our county sheriff appeared in full county paid for taxpayer uniform with the Confederate flag hanging behind him. This is not something that despite the best efforts of our mainstream media to paint as some outsider coming into this community. These are people who are homegrown, born, bred, recruited to behave in these these ways and te to devalue black lives and that not only comes from members of the far right but it comes from people who look ex like who look like me too right um during that campaign i was painted in a very negative light when the truth of the matter is i'm a nurse i'm a caregiver i'm a mother i'm a person that will give the shirt off my back for anyone but i was painted as a, a criminal as a person who was not worthy of respect and that is a part of the problem as well as what the hell does anyone need with an AR-15? It is a weapon that was created for destruction. If you go hunting with it and you shoot an animal, there will be no meat to eat, right? That is a weapon that is intended to be used for mass destruction on a large scale. And there's no excuse for any person in this country to own one, especially an 18 year old child who we know that their brains are not fully formed to, to make good decisions. I have a 20 year old that's laying on my couch right now um, you know, who some, he still forgets to pay a cell phone bill, right? So how is it that a person that is even younger than him is now enlisted to be carrying a high powered assault rifle in communities? And these is, is, this is how we are going to see tragi tragedies like this continue to be perpetuated until we take a stand and say, you have the right to personal protection, which is in the form of a legally owned handgun. You have the right to own a rifle or shotgun where you can go out and hunt animals if that's what you choose to do. But having an assault rifle, having an AR-15, having high powered weapons with extended clips and, and body armor, those things combined tell me that you aim to cause destruction and devastation in communities, particularly in communities where you've researched and you've been in these chat rooms that folks knew about before he was here. This guy was here a month before this tragedy happened. He was in that store two weeks before it happened, harassing and saying, calling folks the N-word in that store. He had infiltrated this community. He, he was staying locally. He didn't drive that day and decide to do this. He did intel. He had background knowledge of who was in that store and, and when and what people's patterns and things like that. So um, this is much less of an isolated incident or even a familial sort of breeding than it is a, a broader systemic issue that has to be addressed. Thank you. Oh, thanks, India. Um, <clears throat> so we have quite a few folks with questions. <clears throat> I'm going to ask um, Bruce to um, ask a quick question and um, wonder if, um, India, you might be willing to sort of try to take these on a on a quick pace, and we'll see how many folks we can we can get we can get through. Go ahead, Bruce. India, when I see Summer Lee give her victory speech, I ask why 
wasn't India Walton able to do that? And, you know, we're in the middle of the midterm primary season now, and there are lots of other candidates out there who are fighting like you did. And it seems to me, since the, the election in Buffalo, you've learned a lot and you're continuing the fight and have a really unique ability to help us figure out what can we do to make sure that what happened to you doesn't happen again as we go through this election cycle. What do you think? I believe that progressives need to lean further into progressive values. I think that one of the biggest mistakes that I made was after the primary, I tried to pivot and make nice with the, the established Democrats um, and really wanted support from folks who had already been in position, didn't get it, but you know, I allow our message to be watered down. I allow our campaign and team to be distracted trying to please the people who were already in power when we should have just doubled down on the things that we wanted, which was true progressive working class values, issues, policies, and a, a real platform moving forward. Wow. Oh, thanks, uh, India. Um, so we have a couple more minutes. I'd like to ask <coughs> David Mivisar M for a very short question <laughs> and hoping we can get to a few more folks. Good. Thank you. Very short, India. Um, uh, I know you are something like the policy advisor for the Working Families Party in Western New York, and I would love for people on this call to know more about the Working Families Party. What is it? How does it function? And how could people active in the Democratic Party also be active with the Working Families Party? That is a great question. Um, thank you for that. The Working Families Party is the third party in states where it is allowed. Um, it's a national organization. I work for the New York Working Families Party and the way Democrats can get involved with the party is by supporting WFP endorsed candidates, um, by donating to the Working Families Party. I, I'm sure you all know that politics is an expensive line of work. Um, but the other thing that you can do if it's allowed in your state is to vote third party. You can be a registered Democrat and still vote on the working families line. And um, we endorse, our endorsement process involves dues paying members. So it's not a top down thing. The membership in the, in the locality determines who are going to be the endorsed candidates through a very lengthy and rigorous endorsement process. I was WFP endorsed, would not have been able to win my primary um, without their support. Um, so I would just encourage folks to do some research, donate, give your time, talent, and treasure, um, but also if you have the ability to vote on the Working Families Party line. All right, uh, Jana, I think we might have to stop, stop there. Jana? Okay. Um, hi, India. Um, I am Buffalo born and raised. When I saw the shooting that happened in the east side, I was heartbroken, but unfortunately, I was not surprised at the response from some Buffalo citizens. White supremacy runs rampant in parts of our city, and it breaks my heart to see. And I want to know what you think is the best way to start uprooting that and looking at it from a more reparative perspective and how people that aren't in Buffalo want to help their city so that we can take this on on national scale as well. I, I appreciate that question. And what I've been telling people is that white supremacy is not a black problem, right? It's not up to me to prove that I'm a good person because people who know me love me. Um, I think that these conversations have to start happening where people don't want to have them. When they say we don't talk politics at Thanksgiving, you need to talk to your uncle, cousin, brother, grandma, whoever it is who has these beliefs and um, make it make it into a real conversation about what white supremacy looks like and pull it up at the root, which which tends to happen in more intimate settings that I'm not privy to, right? Um, it doesn't matter how much education you have as a black person, how well you dress or how well spoken you are, people believe what they believe. And the folks who can change opinions about things like that, or just call it out for the wrong that it is, are people like you. Um, and I, I know that you do your part and you know I would encourage you to be encouraging to other people. They're scary and uncomfortable conversations, but if we don't have them, we will continue to see tragedies like this happen. And um, it's, it's unacceptable and it's, it's up to us to make sure that these things are, are different in the future. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. You know, I, I love my Starbucks folks. 
All right. So um, thank you, India. We have um, so many questions, and I think uh, I think we're going to need to have you back if you'd be willing uh, to uh, to spend some more time with us because um, we're looking we're looking to you uh, and your leadership um, going forward. We're just we're just so grateful um, for everything you're doing and uh, looking for you to be next time you'll be on the ballot. And uh, we're gonna uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Caitlin, who's gonna um, take us to the next sec section of the of the event. Thank you so much. Caitlin? Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, like Sue said, um, my name is Caitlin Kennedy, and I am a Texas voter here in Germany. And first, I wanted to say thank you so, so much to India Walton for joining us today to share your vision on the way forward. We would love to elect candidates like India to office this year, and to do that, we have to vote. Americans abroad have to register to vote and request our absentee ballot every calendar year. So head to votefromabroad.org today to get all squared away to vote in 2022 if you haven't done that yet. And we're gonna pop some links in the chat right now. And yes, now I'm excited to introduce our next two guests, Gianna Reeve and Bill Whitmire from Starbucks Workers United. And first off, we're gonna hear from Bill, who is a co-leader of the union campaign at the Scottsdale Mayo store in Phoenix, which has experienced some of Starbucks worst union busting efforts. When several of his fellow union organizers were unlawfully fired, Bill didn't back down. He has fought alongside his own colleagues and other fired workers at stores across the country. And due to Starbucks delay tactics, a union election result at Bill's store is still pending as challenge ballots are reviewed. Our second guest, Gianna Reeve, is an organizer and shift supervisor at the Camp Road store in Buffalo, one of the first three US Starbucks stores to have a union vote. She shot to the national spotlight last fall when she fearlessly confronted Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz at a meeting in Buffalo, demanding that he sign fair election principles. Months later, the National Labor Relations Board has issued a bargaining order saying that the company must recognize the union at Gianna's store. Starbucks workers like Gianna and Bill have kept the company's stores running in the midst of a global pandemic. But as billionaires like Howard Schultz keep getting richer, those same workers have been left with scraps and little to no say in how their workplaces are run. Despite a lack of federal protections and a number of anti-worker laws in many U.S. states, Starbucks Workers United has won 100 unionized stores across the country, an incredible achievement just five months after their first election. Their movement has not only laid bare the cruel realities of life in late-stage capitalist America, but it has also inspired a new generation of labor activists in the U.S., and we definitely want to take that momentum with us into this year's primaries. So Gianna and Bill, thank you. We're so thrilled to have you with us. And we look forward to learning more about your experiences in the Starbucks union movement. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's great to be here today. And India, thank you so much for your words. And very inspiring. So I'd, I'd like to share a little bit about what's gone on in my store um, and what got me to start unionizing our store and as well what happened and some of the things that are happening right now. So I first off, I always like to say that I started working for Starbucks because on paper, I love the mission of Starbucks and I love the values and I thought it was a great fit for me. I've been, I've been a card carrying progressive democrat for 30 years so i thought this is a great company and shortly after i started working for starbucks i saw a lot wrong um, i saw warning signs that this was a dysfunctional company and when i say dysfunctional i mean leadership i'm not talking about the rank and file it's actually the rank and file worker that makes change in the company um, but some of the things i saw that disturbed me were host hostile work environments uh, I saw that when it came to promotional opportunities, a lot of us weren't given those opportunities. They would actually bring people outside hires in for jobs that those of us internally were, were better qualified for. And unfortunately, I saw a lot of discrimination based, based on race that was going on in stores in regards to promotional opportunities. Some of my friends and mentors, they were going on to work at other higher paying jobs because they, because they couldn't get promoted. And they should have been assistant store managers. They should have been store managers. And they're getting passed over after being with the company for four to five years. And 
So this lead led me to getting very frustrated. And so I started having some conversations with other workers. I reached out to Starbucks Workers United in December because I saw what was going on in Buffalo. And uh, I got some coaching on how to approach some of my coworkers about having a voice in the workplace. And I started having conversations with my friend Layla Dalton, who was also really frustrated with what was happening inside the, inside the store. Layla is a very outspoken young, young person, and she was really trying to make change in the store. So we got together and decided to start this union effort. And shortly after we got started, we had actually we had a majority, we had a majority of cards when we got started after two days. We had a majority of cards. And with after the fourth day of the campaign, Layla was taken in the back room and she was harassed and abused for over an hour and cornered, and they tried to make her quit. Um, but she didn't, she stood strong. And for from January until April 4th, when, April, uh, when uh, Layla got fired, she had a target on her back. Every time she walked in the store, uh, somebody was trying to go after her. Um, then my other colleague, Alyssa, who was also on the organizing committee, she was forced to quit because her availability did not meet store needs. This is another big problem in Starbucks is that um, Starbucks claims to be flexible, but they're not. Uh, you're, you're basically beholden, beholden to them, even though they say, come to work for us, we'll work with your schedule. It's not the case. Um, the other thing about it that uh, we were working towards as, as things unfolded is they started cutting our hours. So if you wore a union pen, because we had like 14 of us wearing union pens, if you had a union pen on, they cut your hours, which put us at risk, many of us at risk of losing our benefits because few people know that the benefits look great, but you can lose your benefits if you're not putting in 20 hours a week. So actually come August, a lot of our workers, I'm talking about half our workforce may lose their benefits because the union, because of union retaliation. Uh, as far as our what happened with our vote, the, uh, uh, the the management started stacking the store with new hires, and they started doing a lot a lot of one on ones with all the new hires that they were bringing into the store. And what happened was, is they started showing the slideshow to all these new hires, and the first slide said, "Vote no for the union," and they said, "Not ignore that. Don't pay any attention to that." And they would show the rest of the slideshow about all the terrible stuff about the union that was total misinformation. Now, keep in mind, I had gone to the management before after we filed for election and said, let us have equal time. I know what you're doing. You're forcing workers to watch this weekly update. You're forcing workers to read this website that has misinformation. Give us, give us equal time and they wouldn't do it. Yet management came in with all these resources to come after these workers which led to our vote, our voting result that right now is, is of course caught, caught up in court. Uh, what's happening now is we have a major federal court case coming up on uh, June the 8th uh, for injunctive relief to get, our, get three of our workers reinstated. If we win that case, it's actually going to be historic. This hasn't happened in many years and uh, not only will, it, will our workers have to be reinstated within five days, Howard, Howard Schultz as well, either Howard Schultz or one of Starbucks executives is going to have to go on video and apologize for what Starbucks has done to our store. Not only that, there will have to be postings across the board at every store nationwide, and uh, there will have to be texts, text messages sent to all stores and in addition, that video will have to show up on external and internal Starbucks websites. So that will be a great day for workers in this journey to becoming real partners instead of just partners in name only. And I appreciate being here today. Thanks a bunch, everyone. Thank you so, so much, Bill. I think now we turn straight over to Gianna for uh, your comments as well. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to speak along with Bill about our experiences organizing with Starbucks Workers United. Towards the beginning of the first three union drives in Buffalo, 
Howard Schultz was flown in as a surprise guest to speak to baristas here. Buffalo partners were invited to what was essentially the Met Gala of captive audience meetings. In order to hear Schultz, a multi-billionaire, discuss the crisis of capitalism to a group of working class individuals and how we don't need unionization to fight that crisis. Um, I attended this meeting with about 40 of my fellow members of Starbucks Workers United. I listened attentively. I waited for him to finish speaking before I offered a copy of our fair election principles for him to sign. Our fair election principles push forward to protect us as workers where the NLRB fails for equal time, for stronger protections, for basic empathy and respect during our union drives. As a result of offering for Howard Schultz to sign this paper while he was in Buffalo, I was booed by corporate yes men and told to sit back down. At one point, a higher up even grabbed my arm and tried to keep me from speaking further. There was no way I could have done what I did without my partners being there with me to support me. When I looked around the room that day, I saw them standing up with me. I never thought making the choice to confront Schultz would amount to anything, but God, was I wrong. The baristas that stood by me were why I fought that night, and the baristas around the country that are seeking unionization are why I continue to fight now. Executive Vice President of Starbucks, Ross Ann Williams, told me that it wasn't my place to say what I did when I did. And if it wasn't then, when could I have? If we don't take bold action now for ourselves, when can we? I'm sure the odds of even a single win seemed bleak for us at first, a small gang of baristas going against an industry giant. This campaign has faced insurmountable odds going against one of the most aggressive anti-union campaigns in modern history. From August to December of last year, I can't remember a time where there wasn't a corporate manager sitting on the floor surveilling moving around our coffee, anything to hear any ounce of the word union. My partners were miserable. And even further, Starbucks has unlawfully fired partners from Buffalo to Arizona in desperate attempts to stop the momentum of our campaign. And it hasn't worked. Workers are fighting back against company exploitation and we are winning. Starbucks has not won 100 union shops by chance. Our success comes from our hope for the future and our drive for change, and no amount of money or empty words from a CEO can stop that. We have the power to take action right now, and we're doing it together. Starbucks Workers United has won 100 union elections as of this past Friday. Imagine how many more union shops we'd have if legislation like the PRO Act was being passed and we had leaders ready to pass that kind of legislation. Leaders like India Walton, who are powerful because of their passion for change, who are powerful because they are community organizers and true public servants before they are anything else. Those are the kinds of people we need in our local offices across the country. We need leaders that are ready to make change happen that we wish to see. Sorry, I prepared paper for this one. Um, the love and support from our local communities only push us to go further. The strength and collective action cannot be understated. I didn't know what solidarity meant or what solidarity felt like until I became involved with Starbucks Workers United. When we strike, other union members are there and ready to make a stand with us. It might sound silly, but seeing unions strong ordered on coffees is incredible. It makes it feel like we are not alone when Starbucks is doing everything in their power with all of their money and all of their resources and all of their manpower to tell that we are alone and that we are wrong. Those small acts tell us that we are not wrong. It shows us that we have the people, we have the support, and it's time for a change to be made in the working class and we can do it ourselves. Um, teachers, nurses, and auto workers show their support for us and we are doing the same. Starbucks Workers United is ready to stand with any worker looking to organize their workplace and workplaces that are already organized because we know how vital that is to our success. We will be on your picket lines, we will be at your marches, and we will probably provide you with more coffee than you can possibly drink. We stand with you and we thank you so much for continuing to stand with us. Thank you guys. Oh, thanks, Gianna. 
I can't even drink one Starbucks coffee. They're so strong for me. <laughs> I don't need lots and lots of them. One is plenty for me. Um, I'm going to turn right to our queue of questions. We have Alan C queued up and then Katie. Alan, do you want to unmute and uh, share your question, whether it's to both, uh, both uh, Gianna and Bill or, or just one? Oh, we're not hearing you, Alan. Are you mute? Are you mute? Can you unmute? Okay. Alan, you're 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 unmuted, but it, it's maybe your computer sound. Is the... Let's let's go to Katie yeah. and see if Alan, Alan can sort out sort out uh, the tech issue. Katie S. Um, Bill and Gianna, I am not a coffee drinker, but I am an Arizona voter, and. Uh, and my, my voting address is probably about two miles from that Starbucks. I want to know what's happening in the store. Uh, is clientele going up? Is it going down? Are people helping when they come in? Uh, what can people be doing? And second question would be, have there been any, any threats of closing that store and opening one two blocks down where they could just get rid of the troublemakers and start over again? Well, th thank you for the question. So what, what's going on inside the store is the, the cafe was closed down for quite some time. They said they closed it for COVID reasons, but really the reason they closed it was they did not want any organizers coming in the store. Um, but now the cafe has been open for a couple of weeks and uh, we're actually as, as busy as ever. So um, and what's encouraging is some customers come up, will come up to me and say, hey, you're, you're the one that was in that article, right? <laughs> and so uh, I, get, I get a lot of positive comments from customers, which is fantastic. So, um, you know, a lot of folks are on our side, which is great. That puts a lot of pressure on Starbucks. Um, the other thing that's happened recently, I mean, I, I can tell you this, um, basically I'm testifying against um, uh, uh, our district manager and our store manager. So you can imagine how there's like a pink elephant in the middle of the room in the store right now. Um, everybody's making nice, but everybody knows what's going on. Um, uh, recently, the dynamics have changed a little bit because they actually brought in an assistant store manager who has actually started to reach out to some of us and is trying to work with some of us. I don't know what that's all about, but you know we're going we're going along with it. But one more time, the way Starbucks works is they'll kind of, they may come in and make nice for a while, but everything that they promise, um, whether or not you get it, uh, you know, I, I always tell people actions speak louder than words. And right now, our workers are very distrustful because of obviously all the things that have happened to us. So um, that's kind of kind of where things are. And as far as what you can do, uh, you know, stop stop by and uh, order a Union Strong coffee. Just say, hey, you know, Union Strong, I'd like to order my Union Strong coffee. Talk to us and encourage us, and uh, that that really helps when we hear it over the uh, over the headset. Or you come in the cafe and have a have a Union Strong coffee. All those things help out. I will spread the word and I might start drinking it too. Thank you. Thank you for your work, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Bill. And Alan has put his question in the chat. Are you able to read that, um, Bill and Gianna? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't. Yeah. I, I can read it. Before you filed uh, your NLRB recognition petition, did you have significantly more than the 30% required is the general counsel seeking a 10 J injunction in Arizona to force Starbucks to rehire your fired workers. And finally, have you sought out local union assistance and what has been the response? Sure. So yes, the, this, this federal hearing on June the 8th is a, is a hearing for, it's a 10 J hearing. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, and the NLRB filed that, um, because going through the traditional methods would, would be an extreme hardship for those three workers. Um, uh, as far as union support, we, it's incredible. So we have, uh, we've received union support from the, um, uh, 
the Teamsters has been outstanding. Uh, we also have support from the I IBEW as well. So, uh, and also work, the Workers United local. So, so Workers United has members here and like uh, that work in warehouses. So they've been incredible in coming out to our rallies. We've had like five rallies at our store to, you know, to send our message loud and clear to management. We've had a lot of support from the unions. Um, and I forgot what, oh, uh, as far as a card majority, we did we did have a card majority um, when we first started, but once management found out about it on basically day three, they literally, they came in so hard and so fast that they dismantled everything quickly. I mean, we, uh, trust me, we did everything we could to, to fight up against them, but they had so many resources and they came after us so quick and fast and they scared the other workers. They had the scare camp campaign going on. They told everyone they were gonna lose their ASU benefits. It was, it was a tough battle. All right, we have a burning question in the chat. If one can order union support tea <laughs> at Starbucks. We have tea, Sorry. yes. And uh, Callie has a hand up as well. Callie, do you wanna unmute? <laughs> Is that okay? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of Buffalo pride in my soul right now. Uh, I get to go home in a little under a month, and I like want to cry tears of joy now. Um, the Elmwood store is where I bought all of my coffee if I wasn't going to spot for all of high school. Um, I've had some like very weird moments in that store, and it holds like a real special place in my heart. But the thing that I ask myself now, like we're really excited about having a union victory and we're glad that this is spreading and more people are having the opportunity, but I don't think that it ends once you have an affirmative vote. What are what can people do to support and keep this momentum moving forward? And what needs to be done after there has been um, um, a positive outcome uh, to make sure that this doesn't kind of um, burn out before we really set the fire? Fantastic question. And also, you know, Buffalonian to Buffalonian, and we can't wait to have you back over here. Um, it's a funny thing because a lot of the like media attention is usually on the um, the drive to get the union and then it sort of fizzles when you have it, but there's still the fight for the contracts that are in place right now. What we can do is we can still call on Starbucks to bargain with us respectively and bargain in good faith. Um, it sounds funny, but it's, I guess it's a new day and age of union busting and showing support for unionization. Blow up their Twitter, call them, call 1-800-STARBUCKS and tell them that, you know, I will only shop at a union store and I expect you guys to bargain and put good faith if you still want my money. Our main power that we have as individuals is our power as voters and our power as consumers, unfortunately. So we need to use that in whatever way we can. And I am excited to have you in our Elmwood store. And please be sure to tell everybody that, um, you know, put Union Strong on your coffee cup and they'll be happy to chat you up. Um, thank you so much for your support. Thanks, everyone. I'll just encourage mm -hmm. folks to vote for primary candidates who support the PRO Act and strong unions in, uh, in the United States. And um, thank you, John and Bill, for the important work you're doing, giving us a, giving us a glimpse on the inside. I, I imagine that on the uh, Starbucks Workers United um, website, there might be some suggestions for what customers can do uh, to provide support, like um, Gianna's su suggestions there. So um, keep up the good work. Thanks. And I'm going to turn us now uh, to, to Bruce. Thanks, Sue. You know, Bill and Gianna make it perfectly clear as our revolution puts it, when we organize, we win. And the PRO Act wouldn't hurt either. <clears throat> Starbucks Workers United reached that major milestone with over 100 union votes this past week and an 85% success rate. As I understand it, there are maybe 200 votes on deck. Along with teachers, nurses, and others, not least of all the Staten Island Amazon workers, they inspire us to follow their lead and act boldly. To act effectively on the road to the midterms, we must learn the lay of the land, know what's at stake, understand early trends in the primaries, and determine which candidates will deliver on racial justice, labor justice, voting rights, climate change, healthcare, 
campaign finance reform and more. That is why we are so fortunate to have Larry Cohen, a true progressive champion, join us today. Larry has been organizing and winning for decades as head of the Communication Workers of America, DNC superdelegate supporter of Senator Sanders, who initiated the Unity Reform Commission in the aftermath of all that 2016 primary shenanigans, and as founder of our revolution. More recently, he supported India Walton, opposing the tactics of Byron Brown, used to retain his position as Buffalo's mayor and calling for his resignation. Larry has his fingers on the pulse of our nation. He knows the lay of the land and what's at stake right now. Larry can help us navigate the primaries and plug into opportunities to act. It should come as no surprise that it is his Communication Workers of America who are leading the fight for the PRO Act, which would make the work of Bill, Gianna, and countless others all across the country much easier. Take a look at their petition in the chat box. Larry, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so great to be here and great to follow um, India and the amazing Starbucks workers. Uh, there's, there are things that tie these fights together. Uh, the way I like to put it is it's the rules, not just the rulers. Uh, as president of CWA for 10 years and building a grassroots political program, I used to tell people we're, we're candidate addicted, you know, literally like heroin and I would stab my arm as if with a needle. Uh, the rules in the United States are outlier rules. They're based on an 18th century democracy. They're the worst organizing rules of any democracy. Starbucks workers in most places where you're based, retail workers would have sectoral bargaining. It's presupposed. Joining a union is an internal decision. It's like internal organizing in the US. Shall I join or shall I not join? Obviously, we believe we need to all join. The NLRB, just to stick on this for a minute, has the best general counsel ever. I know her well, Jennifer Abruzzo. 23 years at the NLRB, then a short stint at CWA when Trump fired her. She was deputy general counsel and now back. There's never been anybody like her in terms of experience or anything else. It can be frustrating to Starbucks workers because they wait and wait. And what many of them don't know is that in the Trump budget, they smashed the NLRB, cut it to shreds. And in the Biden budgets, it's not yet returned, not because of Biden's fault. It has to do with the outrageous budget process. Again, the rules of the United States Congress. And so Starbucks has far more money to spend, think about this, on lawyers than the NLRB does. That's what we face. It's the rules, not just the rulers. It's the rules when people organize. It's the rules when they go to register to vote. It's the rules in the Democratic Party. Let's go to Buffalo and India Walton. And I still am outraged about this because the Mayor Brown and the New York Party chair who colluded from minute one to first try to create a new party they called the Buffalo Party. When they couldn't get on the ballot that way, they then went to a write-in campaign funded by every disgraceful, and I, have, I grew up in Philadelphia, I got four letter words for these pigs, but um, Republican corporate right-wing interests in America to support that write-in campaign. And they're on the DNC, the mayor is on the DNC and the party chair, it's a total violation. You're all progressive Democrats here. And let me just say that as frustrated as we may get, we have to fight in every state party, not so much the DA, it's one of the most democratic rules that I have ever seen, but in the parties where you also belong, that fight goes on in every party to change how the party operates. Jay Jacobs, the chair, should be thrown out. He should be thrown off the DNC. He's violated the DNC rules time and time again. In 2018, 
at the DNC, the Unity Reform Commission, which came out of the Bernie uprising and the 2016 convention, the Unity Reform Commission, which I vice chaired, voted that the party must establish an ombuds committee so that there was an internal procedure. It is four years later. It doesn't exist. We formed the Reform Caucus of DNC members, now more than 50 strong. Two of your members of your eight are on. I hope Candace gets involved and joins. I know she's on this call. The two of your eight have already joined. Our third Zoom meeting will be on Wednesday. It's just for DNC. It's not an organizing thing. It's only how do we behave in the DNC? How do we put up with what happened to India Walton? It's absolutely inexcusable what happened to India Walton. The party chair violated the state, the national party rules in not backing the primary winner. And not only did he not back her, I've seen that before, he led the fight to have a writing campaign throw her out. And I'll tell you, I've been around a long time. I've seen fascist mayors, like when I grew up in Philadelphia, who was a Democrat. Now I got my dog excited. She's starting in on me here. Um, she's a rescue dog, so I need to be kinder and calmer. <laughs> I grew up with Frank Rizzo. Most of you are too young. Look him up. He was literally a fascist police commissioner. I got arrested there dozens of times as a white kid. I probably would have been killed as a black kid. He was a Democrat. And we finally stopped him after 12 years when he couldn't run again. But it's the rules, not just the rulers, whether that allowed Rizzo in the Democratic Party in 1972, or whether it allows Brown to be on the DNC. The mayor is also on the DNC. And a state party chair like Jay Jacobs, none of those DNC members are elected. Look at how the DA members are elected to the DNC, and then look at how the New York people get on the DNC. This is true of all the Northeastern parties until you get to New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. They're all remnants. They haven't been cleaned up. I know that Katie is on from Arizona. We just heard from her. And my friend Donnie, who chairs France, is on. And I should say I have a bunch of friends on here. Now I started mentioning some and not the rest. But um, Arizona has a beginnings of a reform party. Their state committee censored Christian cinema. Again, the rules, not just the rulers. The US Senate, no other parliamentary body in the rule behaves like this with the filibuster. And, and, and the rules go on and on and on. I'm not going to spend even another minute on that. I know we're all united on the filibuster, the racist origins of the filibuster. But reform is possible in these state parties. Arizona is an example. Cinnamon never would have been censored in the New York party. And too many of us who come from those states, as I said, I grew up in Pennsylvania, 20 years in the Union in New Jersey, then DC, now Maryland, for me. Every one of those parties needs reform. They all have remnants back into the, the uh, again, the, uh, we'll just call them the horrible days of the old Democratic Party. West of the Mississippi, it's much different. Call to action. Get involved in that state party if you can. Your eight members, we need you on this reform effort. Number one, we're demanding that ombuds committee get established. When the Washington Post described our first meeting, all of a sudden they took step one to establish that committee and now they haven't followed up. It's five, it's four years later. Midterm elections. Our revolution, as, as Bruce said, I chair the board. Uh, it's an all-volunteer board, obviously, a great staff, but it's mostly volunteer-led. Mostly is an understatement. It's almost all volunteer-led. There's 25 more primaries. I'm not going to try to shout them all out here. Between now and Rhode Island in mid-September. For everybody in this progressive caucus, and I should have mentioned, many states now have a progressive caucus in the party. You can Another call to action. You can all help strengthen and build that, particularly in these Northeast and Southern Democratic parties. But as I said about OR and, and the midterms, and it's not just OR, we work with all kinds of allies. Every election is different. Who are those allies? But there's 25 more ending in Rhode Island. 
in mid-September. If we believe, as I would argue, that the only path to federal change comes through the House of Representatives, it is the people's house. It's much more like the rest of parliament, the parliamentary bodies, the rest of the world. And inside that House of Representatives, of the 222 members that are currently Democrats, about 100 now have joined the Progressive Caucus and I would call 50 of them core progressives. The other 50 join, like Chantal Brown in Cleveland, so she can claim to be in the caucus and get their support when she runs against Nina Turner. You want to talk about another disgrace. And I love the Progressive Caucus. I didn't love that. And they have rules about that. They need to be enforced. And so the path to change, like it or not, and it's tough. I used to say in CWA, hard and all but hopeless in America. It's much more hopeful in Mexico or almost any country that you could imagine that has some kind of democracy than in the US because the rules again of our democracy almost prevent change. And I know that again, I'm diverting for a second. The DA has long been a champion of Medicare for all. And you look at the healthcare of all the members on this call on every nation. And then you look at the US and you look at the fact that over a million people died of COVID in the US. Number one, the greatest number of deaths anywhere in the world. And we don't have the highest population. And number two, not only the greatest number of deaths, but the greatest proportion of deaths per 100,000 people, except for a handful of much smaller and poorer countries. And it's directly related to the lack of public health. And uh, and the medical, broken down medical system that we have in the US. And we can't pass Medicare for all. We can't pass even Medicare negotiating pharma prices, which we came close to. We're bringing down the age of Medicare because of how the federal government, the rules in that federal government, overwhelmingly people believe that they don't wanna pay twice what they pay, twice what you all pay, for pharmaceuticals in every other country in the world. Nobody wants to pay that. But the pharmaceutical lobby bores into the Democratic Party, state after state, with donations, candidate after candidate. I was asked to comment on the results so far. Obviously, I was very unhappy. Unhappy is not the word. Nina Turner is an amazing candidate, just like India Walton. They're very close. She gets defeated by big money pouring in to the Democratic primary from Republicans and from corporate America and from the wealthiest Americans. And why is that? Because they know that that's a single party district. And it turns out, big secret here, that most Democrats and most Republicans are elected in single party districts. The only election, and this is to everybody on here, this is why we need the Progressive Caucus in the DA and in every state, that most candidates in the House and Senate are elected in the primary. AOC had no general election. She had no candidate. Many of them have token candidates. It's all about the primaries. It's all about the rules in those primaries. And I'm used up my minutes, so I'm not going to go on and on here. But we have also had great successes. And many of them are well known, like Summer Lee or in Texas, where Jasmine Crockett won in Dallas and Greg Cesar in, in uh, Austin. And we still don't know who's going to win between Cisneros and Cuellar in that district. And again, a disgrace that Democratic leadership came in and campaigned for him. But think about this, my last comment about rules and rulers. Not a single state party does anything about super PAC money in their primaries. That can be regulated in different ways by the state party. There can be a demand for transparency about where does that money come from in those state parties and how they operate. Bernie Sanders wrote a letter to the chairman of the DNC, Jamie Harrison, which our revolution is holding up and we want to can and we will campaign on and we will bring this to the DNC again why do we form a group 
inside the DNC for reform, analogous to the Progressive Caucus. Because the DNC itself reeks of corruption. It reeks of this White House. And I support Biden and will if he runs again. But that's because of who he'll run against. But right around Biden, his political operatives are all revolving door Democrats, making millions and then coming back into the government. The same thing that goes on at the DNC itself. And so we must bring to the public and to every state party this corruption of these super PAC money. It's not just about general elections. It's not just about Republicans. It's about the corruption in the Democratic Party that we have the ability to solve. So I'm going to stop there. Action. Get involved, Progressive Caucus, in every state party. Build the DA Progressive Caucus. Ask the DA members to join the reform group that we have in the DNC. Get involved, particularly if you haven't voted yet, in supporting progressive candidates at all levels, not just the House of Representatives, in the primaries to come. And realize that it's mostly in the primaries that we work for change. And then, of course, take action and defeat the now fascist Republican Party in the general election. Thank you all. Oh, oh boy. Thanks, Larry. Oh, my gosh. OK, everybody got our marching orders there. And we have one question real fast from Bruce Murray. And then we're, we're, we need a quick answer from you, uh, Larry, and, and, we'll, and we'll move on to our next speakers. Oh, my gosh. All right, Bruce. Larry, you got us all fired up. You got me fired up. And what I want to figure out is for the last 50 years, I've been saying, if you don't like the rules, don't break them, change them so that they're the right ones. And uh, your message is right on as far as I'm concerned. And what I'm trying to figure out, we're in a democracy, rule of law, we have to get a majority. And uh, you said we have 100, maybe it's 101 members in the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And you set it up, 50 seem to be really in for it, and 50 others, eh. And do you have any advice for us on how we can get to the other 50 to bring them on board for real reform? Uh, yeah, Susan asked for a quick answer. Uh, the only thing I'll say to that, Bruce, is you're right on. I think some of them are hopeless, uh, close to hopeless, um, and they just joined. It's all political expediency. Uh, Pramila Jayapal did establish rules to throw them out. If they don't vote with the caucus two thirds of the time and show up at the majority of the meeting, they're out. I think that's important. I think we have to look for more things like that that screen them out. And I think the main thing, Bruce, is to elect more uh, that'll join them. There's a lot more down the road. Uh, I didn't mention people like McLeod Skinner, who won in Oregon against Schrader, one of the worst Democrats in the House. Um, so there's a lot more that we can do in that way. I think that's more likely than how we're going to persuade people um, who take money from pharma, from big oil, from the military industrial complex um, uh, uh, to become uh, reformers. Larry, I have a quick question for you. When is our revolution going to do a town hall, the Monday, the Monday night town hall during the day so the folks in Europe can, uh, can attend? It's in the middle of the night for our many, many DA members in Europe. And I know we've got, uh, we've got DSA, uh, Germany folks who'd like to attend, uh, our revolution, France, all kinds, of, all kinds of folks out there. So I'll tell you what, you, asking you, for that. Uh, I will ask our folks to set one up for DA even if it's in the middle of the night, I, I <laughs> pledge this dog is really carrying on now. I apologize. I usually take her to a neighbor's. But anyway, um, uh, even if it's in the middle of the night, what is the ideal time before I overcommit here? Because oh, we got to get one of the engineering types to the, do the call. I, what usually works pretty well is uh, like morning Eastern time, like 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 oh, eight or nine. Easy. Okay, then it works in Asia easy. Pacific. It works in Asia, Asia Pacific yeah, yeah, yeah. in the evening. It's Europe during the day. The only folks who don't like it are like the folks in Vancouver. Sorry, everybody in Vancouver. <clears throat> they have to get up early. Okay, I'll tell you what. If, if you and Candace or whoever want to uh, talk to me about organizing that, I will make sure it gets done. I didn't realize it could be in the morning. That's great. 
Yeah, that's fine. Oh, you know, and the folks in Vancouver can watch the normal Monday night ones, so we don't they don't, we don't have to worry. They're, they that's right. I can do yeah, that it's here. Every in other week, just to put a plug in, Keith Ellison was on the last one. Um, he's an incredible expert, as you know. He prosecuted uh, the George Floyd murders um, because the city of Minneapolis couldn't do it as state attorney general. Um, but you know, uh, the, the the calls inspire me. Yeah, they're yeah, they're very inspiring. So anyway, we will organize one for you all. If you all just get in touch with me about when you want to do it. All right. All right. Give Thanks, us some Larry. Lead time so I get somebody right. on that will okay. inspire you. Yeah. Okay, we'll do. Well, the next thing I was going to mention really relates to what you were talking about, uh, about state parties, because um, Democrats Abroad has a really exciting new initiative this year, which is around state abroad teams. So there's state teams. They're mostly around battleground states, but they're not, they're not limited. They're not limited to that. Um, and they've been putting on uh, candidate events. Um, they, they start, this kind of started when, um, Democrats abroad got involved in, um, our successful efforts to get out the vote, um, to help secure the, um, Georgia margin of victory for, um, for Biden and for the Senate and the teams focus on voter education, voter participation and advocacy, and they're open to all members of Democrats abroad who vote in or have a strong connection to the states that are represented. Um, there's actually lots of different types of volunteer roles with the state teams, and it would be great to have members of the Progressive Caucus joining those state teams and, uh, and participating in those activities, um, connecting with the progressive candidates that might be invited to, uh, to candidate events that the state teams uh, are, putting, are putting on. There's info in the chat or coming into the chat on how to get involved. Um, the state teams right now are Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Maryland, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin, and Maine. Uh, as a Susan, I'll just say that most Susans are pretty decent, but there's one Susan I'd like to kick to the sidewalk, preferably one with chalk messages supporting women's rights to control our own bodies. So uh, yeah, so think about joining a state team, folks. And boy, we need one for New York to deal with uh, to deal with the Democratic Party. And I've met a few folks uh, in the Democratic Party in Massachusetts that I could have a few words for. So um, I'm a Connecticut voter, but I have Massachusetts connections. So all right, our next folk uh, folk folk person talking is. Um, Carol Moore, who uh, is um, taking a leadership role in candidate events for Democrats abroad this um, this cycle. And so uh, Carol's going to give us a little information about that. Hey, Carol. Hello, Sue. And let me say, this has been so inspiring, uh, listening to Larry, listening to India, everyone. Um, and what I want to talk a little bit about is how our members can get involved even around the world. So um, I lead a team uh, that is uh, organizing with the state teams that Sue was just describing, setting up candidate events uh, through the primary uh, and into the general election. And um, our goals are to get out the vote. Uh, we are doing phone banking, uh, and we are wanting to show our members around the world how they can actually meet online with the uh, candidates that we need to elect. And remember, midterm elections are not a great time to have a great turnout. And this is where Democrats abroad, and as Larry and you all were talking about, Democrats in the, in, in the U.S. really have to get our grassroots effort out. So um, we, we think that is uh, what we're doing. We want to educate DA members also about voting down ballot. This means voting in state and local elections where we have to take back some of these dreadful state legislatures. I vote in Florida and, and I'm chairing that committee, guys. And anybody from any blue state that wants to help in Florida, a real goal is to get rid of Ron DeSantis in November and stop him from uh, aspiring to being uh, the Republican candidate in 24. Uh, but we also want to increase DA membership and raise the profile of DA. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our issues, tax being a big one, as many of you know. Uh, and this is a chance to let our um, candidates running for the House in particular and the Senate, what DA is about, 
how our voters can contribute to a democratic win and what some of our issues are that we really need legislation on going into 2023. Uh, as Sue mentioned, uh, she mentioned the key states that we're working on, Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia. We're starting a California team. I see a couple of California people uh, are here today. Uh, and, and here, what we're talking about, even in a blue state, we have about six races in the House that are battleground races. And we really need to see those races. Three of them are to keep Democratic incumbents in, and three of them are races that we could flip. Democrats could flip. So, um, so do join us. I'll put my email uh, address in the chat box. We're having an organizing meeting for California to get that started uh, and have panels for candidates in the summer. Um, and I'll put that in. But Wisconsin, Arizona, uh, Michigan, and Florida, their primaries are not until August. Uh, I mean, we really have a, a, a quite a, a you know, a lineup of um, uh, chances for you to see more candidates. Some of them have already happened. Many of you, I hope, have been listening in on them. Uh, we had a fantastic event, in, uh, in fact, with Beto O'Rourke just three weeks ago. Uh, and, and it's wonderful for our people to be able to hear these candidates in person. We need volunteers, and this is the way you can help candidate outreach. We need editors to write on the state team pages, which are now on the DA website. Social media promotion. We want to reach Americans, Democrats, Americans abroad who are not yet knowing how to vote. Get them to votefromabroad.org. We could use event management help and tech support. And finally, phone banking. This is the way to really motivate our members to make sure they know they can get their ballot, they can register, they can vote in the primary and they can vote in the general election. So do go to DA, uh, the DA website and we'll put some links in the chat box. We have pending events coming up. North Carolina has a wonderful woman who just won the Democratic primary for Senate. We can flip North Carolina's Senate seat. Sherry Beasley will be speaking to us in June. Arizona, Katie Solon is organizing some great events. Uh, and the Wisconsin primary events are coming up June 18th. Thank you. J there you see it. June 18th and June 22nd. Uh, so there's my email address. Feel free to email. I'd love to chat with you and connect you wherever you think you can help, help whatever time you can give over the next four or five months. And thank you all for working to elect Democrats uh, and keep the House and get the Senate up to 52 or more Democratic senators. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right. So um, I'm just going to share uh, quickly another, another volunteer opportunity for folks. Um, which is uh, what we're calling in Canada voter promoter. <laughs> and it's real easy. You just tell everybody you talk to, you find some way to put it into the conversation wherever you are abroad that, uh, that, you're, that, that Americans overseas can vote. And the way to do it is to go to votefromabroad.org and to ask them to share that information with their, with their friends and family and colleagues. So that's, um, that's a great way that you can make a difference. And another thing is to phone bank uh, or provide voter assistance with Democrats abroad. That takes a little bit of a training, um, but once you get uh, trained up, um, it's actually quite enjoyable to do the phone banking. People love to hear from fellow DA members. They like getting those calls um, and, uh, and those who want to vote really need help um, getting through the barriers. Every state has different rules. Some of them make it really hard uh, to, uh, to vote from abroad. And so um, we want to make that easy for people. We want more and more people to do that. And generally speaking, the votes from overseas tend to be more uh, on the uh, progressive end of the Democratic Party. So, um, so you're helping to get out progressives as well. So next we're going to hear from David Mivasser, and he lives just a short distance from me here in Canada. And uh, David has several roles with Democrats abroad. And today he's going to share with us a number of other impactful ways to help progressive primary candidates win in key races, including in solid blue districts. Hey, David. Good. Thank you so much. Um, wait a minute, let me just get oriented here. Yeah, so I have been very active with Democrats abroad, of course. I'm doing all kinds of things with Democrats abroad, but I've also recently, for the last few months, been involved with campaigns 
in the States on the ground in places where I think that'll make a difference. And I was involved with Nina Turner's campaign. I was involved with the successful campaign by Summer Lee, who we saw at the beginning of this, um, you know, this event here today. And more recently with Jessica Cisneros campaign and there's other campaigns. And the reason I'm talking about this is to encourage others in Democrats abroad, wherever we live, to volunteer with these specific campaigns where we know we can make a difference. We just heard Larry Cohen say how important it is to win the, uh, the primaries. You know, that's where the real decisions are often made. And I have found that I can be very effective using text banking through these campaigns. There was one particular day when I sent texts in Summer Lee's campaign to over 14,000 voters. Hundreds of them replied to me. I was able to kind of process the replies that does voter ID, like who are the supporters. It gives them information that they need so that they can go vote, answering questions for them. It's a very, very effective thing. And while we're active with Democrats abroad, reaching out to Americans living abroad, many, 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 many more voters don't live abroad. They live in the states and in the districts. And that's, I think, a very effective way to be active. Um, and I just wanna say something else besides the, the primary campaigns that we have interests in, there are very important swing states like my state, Pennsylvania, where we're going to elect a new US Senator. And I have directly volunteered with the PA Dems. So even though I don't live in Pennsylvania, I'm able to directly participate through phone banking and text banking with the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, just for example. So you could volunteer with the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, the Texas Party, the Georgia Party, the Michigan Party, pick one of those swing states. And you know, tiny number of votes can make a difference. So if I have more time, I could I could post into the Slack some links to help people do this. And of course, if you want, I can take some questions. We have those links all ready to drop in the chat for you, David. They're re they're ready to go. It's all going to be dropped in uh, in a second. And right. I I think it's just great that David has kind of curated these uh, opportunities. And um, I think you were willing to hear from people directly, David, as well, right? Oh yeah. If they oh, want, yeah. want like, help from you, but how to? Anyone who's interested in knowing yourself personally, you know, you'd like to be involved with a campaign or a state feel free just get in touch with me you can find me through democrats abroad um you know i'm gonna put in a link that i didn't send to you earlier sue but um india walton talked about it and that's the working oh, families oh, I, party I, I added working families party to your list you're so smart <laughs> beat me to it okay uh, democrats one, one more thing try. if i have another minute i want to say so going 30, all the way 30 back, seconds how much 30 seconds okay seriously so there's another group that does amazing pragmatic fine-grained up close voter protection and elect election integrity work and it's called vo pro voter protection pros and that's another way to participate from abroad with what's going on like on the ground in the states and i I can't follow the chat, but Sue, did you post a link for Vopro Pros? Yeah, Vopro Pros is in. Vopro Pros is in there. Yep. Okay. Just, just people just uh, scroll up a few. I'll just say I, I was part of like a data mining project for over nine thousand polling places in the state of Pennsylvania, looking for who was elected as the judge of elections in that polling place. What's their background? What can we expect from them? And we created a database of over 9,000 polling places. And that's just one example of what Vote Pro Pros is, is doing, working together with many other groups. All right. Thank you. David, yep. David, would you like people to find you on the Democrats Abroad Hamilton site? Or or um, do you want to? Oh, however they can find me. I'm, I'm not picky. You can put my personal email in there. Well, I'll you can do, do that in the want. chat. If you want to do that, you can do that in the chat. Or people can ask for it, and you can private message it to them in yep. the chat, whatever's your or, choice. 
Or if somebody knows how to reach Sue, she can tell you how to reach me. But feel free to uh, write me or, or call okay. me. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. So we just uh, have a couple more things to share with folks, probably another five minutes or so. And I'll invite Bruce to chat now. Thanks, Sue. Thanks also, David. And thanks to everybody. I want to put in a couple plugs too for young people who want to volunteer. Take a look at what the Sunrise Movement is doing or Next Gen. They also have great phone banking, texting, and other operations. And another favorite too is People's Action with their uh, deep canvassing movement. They're really strong. I want to thank everybody who spoke today and all who have helped behind the scenes to ensure the event's success. But whether or not it is really successful depends on what we do now. I have done my homework, know who I want to support, am ready to rail, mail in my Illinois primary ballot now. That is step one for all of us. The next step is to encourage all in our Democrats Abroad networks to do the same so that we can be the margin of difference again in races up and down the ballot for candidates who will deliver what we really need. The inspiring messages we heard today move us to sharpen the focus on issues that demand even more attention. An important way to get out our messages through social media. We really need your help in extending our progressive message by following, liking, and subscribing to our newly established social media accounts. Take a look for them in the chat box now. If you would like to join our issue advocacy team or help in other ways, please use our volunteer form also in the chat box. And be sure to join our monthly Mondays for Progressive Minds to continue this discussion with our summer sessions. Betsy, can you tell us more about what Daniel and you are planning? Betsy, need to unmute. Can, I hope you can hear me now. We can, all the way from Finland. Great. Great. Well, Daniel uh, Stein and I uh, would like to invite you to our summer sessions. And in the summer, we're going to have our monthly uh, Monday events on the last Monday of the month, as usual. On Monday, June 27th, our topic will be bring your favorite legislation. And we ask all attendees to do just that. We'll have a discussion about legislation which you see as important to pass or legislation which has passed already. On Monday, Ju July 25th, we're gonna discuss what to know about campaign finan finance. And we're gonna have Sue Cronenfeld, who I think is on this call, who's our expert on campaign finance to help lead our discussion. On Monday, August 29th, our topic will be the need for labor unions and their importance. And we hope to have a lively conversation about that. So please feel free uh, to come, feel welcome, come to discuss these, our summer topics. Our format will probably be a little bit less formal and perhaps more relaxed. And I'm gonna ask Sue uh, to put the sign up in the uh, chat box www.democratsabroad.org slash PC events. So please come, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right, uh, Antar, did you have any closing comments? Hey guys. Yes, so um, thank you. Uh, Yes, so as we heard from India and as we heard from uh, our uh, guests from Starbucks, um, the intersections of economic injustice and racial injustice and labor injustice intersect at many different levels. So at this point in time, um, there's a major coalition working together in the United States right now, the Why We Can't Wait Coalition, and they're trying to get President Biden to enact federal reparative justice legislation to address the root causes for many racial disparities within America by Juneteenth. Uh, that is having him in effect through executive order enact a reparation study bill 
by the 19th of June. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post in the chat right now. Uh, I'll do it. Oh, you keep okay. talking. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, uh, Caitlin is going to post in the chat right now um, various links that not only get you supporting the uh, campaign, but also can inform you on exactly where we intend to go and our vision with this campaign. So um, there's going to be a link. You can sign up for the um, next uh, reparations task force uh, meeting. That's Democrats, Democrats Abroad's reparations task force. Um, uh, they're popping up all over the country because this movement is uh, gaining so much momentum. Um, there's also a social media toolkit to support the um, Why We Can't Wait Coalition's push to get Biden to do his damn job. Um, reparative justice is a part of the Democratic Party platform. Um, a National Reparations Commission is indeed a part of the Democratic Party platform. And the DNC has even, you know, for all, what it's worth, signed on to such a promise. Now it needs to happen because Biden risks losing a lot of power if he doesn't enact reparative and progressive policies that will really give his base something to work with. Um, please fill out the petition. This is a direct conduit to get Biden to pay attention to this, uh, uh, in effect, this advocacy push that is you know, really coming to a head. It's going to be a showdown and Juneteenth is the deadline. So please join the power, help us out. Thanks. All right, let's get out there and be the change we want to see. So yeah, Democrats Abroad is an all volunteer run organization. We're contacting tens of thousands of members uh, to help them vote and invite them to participate in things like the Reparations Task Force, the Reparations um, uh, HR 40 uh, petition that Antar just shared and all kinds of um, actions uh, to make life better for Americans. And uh, we uh, we invite you to help mobilize all of our uh, work and the progressive votes of Democrats abroad um, by funding our phone banking, texting and advertising efforts. Um, and through that, um, you'll be giving thousands of volunteers the tools they need to close the gaps for victories across the country. Um, DA is calling uh, and emailing members about their primaries. So um, even in states that are that are blue or districts that are blue, people are being reminded that they have a primary. It's, it's really great and it'll help get out um, progressive voters. So um, there's a, um, we'll put in the chat uh, information about donating and uh, let you know that no gift is too small to make a difference. How about a dollar for the number of congressional progressive caucus senators in the, uh, in the congressional Pro progressive caucus? We have one senator. You could donate one dollar in his honor, in his honor. Um, or you could donate $100 for the number of CPC House representatives. We'll throw in those 50 posers just uh, to be nice today. And uh, perhaps you might give an amount equal to the number of new members you want to see join the CPC. And I want to thank everyone, uh, especially our inspiring speakers, the amazing India Walton, Bill Whitmire, Gianna Reeve, and Larry Cohen. <clears throat> and behind the scenes, thank you to Drasana Hughes from India's campaign and Aaron Chappelle at Our Revolution. We also thank our Democrats Abroad speakers, Carol Moore in the UK and David Mivisar in Canada and our fantastic event team, Eileen Dinan, our monthly Mondays team, Betsy Atori in Finland and Daniel Stein in Mexico. And of course, Caitlin Kennedy and Antar Keith in Germany and uh, Bruce Murray in Australia. And I'm Sue Alexness in Canada. Stick around to chat informally if you like after we've served we're served this strong cup of truth from Gianna Reeve. Thank you, everybody. We're just uh, getting our video queued up. Our tech person, Eileen. Hi, Roxanne. You know how much this means to me, and you know how much I love my yes, partner. And, this is about and I resonate so much with Howard and what he said, because he wants what's best for this company, and he knows where the future is going for our company. And the strength we have is our strength with each other. How many of us are wearing all this Partners speak. That's fine. That is, I have not had equal time. 
So Howard Schultz, please, if you care, if you care about your partners in Buffalo, please sign the fair election principle. Please, I have a Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you. Okay. And you know how much I love my yes, partner. Do. And this is about And I resonate so much with Howard and what he said. Because this he wants what's best for this company. All right, we can stop our recording, I think, at this point. Thank you, everybody. And um, we thought we'd just stick around informally if people if people would like to do that at the end. See, we still have quite a few folks on the folks on the call. And I think I am uh, currently the one who has uh, leave the meeting control and uh, I'm in it for another 15 minutes and uh, would love to hear how people are feeling. I know Can I, I got fired up many times <laughs> and I'm fired up now and how are you all feeling? Who's stopping the recording? Who's got that job? 